having a single eye. And what we have to understand, God wants us to be focused on what we need to be focused on at this hour. If not, we're going to allow all the distractions that are around us to take us off course. Now, when it comes to our nation and really any other nations, and sometimes when things happen, I just think people need to travel. We have to remember the Bible says that Satan is the God with the little g over the world. And so what he wants to do is he wants to divide and conquer nations. So he uses various things to divide and conquer in different nations. Right now, what's going on? He's using racism, the black and white thing. He's using that to do what? Divide and conquer or try to divide and conquer in our nations. Now, um, and so we look at things, and it's, it, what is going on is wrong. So I'm not saying, oh, I'm in agreement with any of the things that's going on, how, how people of color are being treated, etc. I'm not in agreement with it, but you have to understand, what's going on today, I'm not talking about 100 years ago, okay? I remember probably about eight years ago or something with our missions, uh, Rob Parsley's ministry, there were a lot of Africans that were enslaved by other Africans, and we sent money for them to be set free. Nobody here is a slave. I remember uh, probably, and you have to understand, it's just the enemy, if you can stop looking at the people, okay? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rules of the darkness of this world. He's the God with the little g over the earth, and so he tries to divide and conquer every nation. Stop always being so full of yourself when we just think about us, America. It's the same scheme with every nation, he just used different things. Um, uh, another time, I remember, I think it was around 2008 in Kenya, what was going on, they had some kind of election. You know, election brings a lot of division into a nation. And even though they were the same color, what happened was they were tribe against tribe over that, uh, at war against that particular election. Then go to Pakistan, okay? Uh, in Pakistan, we've out of missions, we've sent money because in Pakistan, it's more like based on economics. And like I said, they're all the same race. They're all Pakistanians, okay? But it's almost like a caste system, and the poor people are treated really bad. And so it was this woman who was a widow, and she was like, you know, poor in that lower level. And what happened was her husband had died. They owed a debt, so she was taken as a slave. And so we sent money to pay the debt so she could be released and wouldn't have to be a slave. And that's going on today, okay? And so what you have to understand, it's all, if you, if you get your eyes focused on the truth, the truth is the enemy, Satan, is the one who wants to divide and conquer nations. So if he can divide a nation, he can conquer it. And it's all the root of it, why we so easily allow him to do things, is because the root of sin. We live on a sin-cursed earth. But we're going to go back to this. <clears throat> Having a single eye. The eye is the light of the body or our being. So our eye or our focus needs to be single, focusing on the light to be full of light and not full of darkness. So turn with me to Matthew 6 and 22. And while we're turning, uh, the word that's used as for a single in Matthew 6 and 22, that's a Greek word spelled H-A-P-L-O-U-S, and it is translated as single, okay? Now, uh, it means singleness, simplicity, absence of fold. This, however, does not involve stupidity on the part of the Christian, but rather prudence, knowing how to deal with fellow, fellow humans and the circumstances of life, okay? And that's the source is Greek, Hebrew, study key Bible, uh, lexical age to the New Testament, okay? So that's what, we, uh, what was stated there. Now, so when we're looking at it here, uh, Matthew 6 and 22, and it simply says, the lamp of the body is the eye. What does a, a lamp do? It, it produces light. It's the eye. If therefore your eye is good, taking in good stuff, your whole body will be what? Full of light. You remember years ago they used to have this saying in nutrition, they may still have it, I don't know, but it was said, you are what you eat. That's the same thing spiritually. What you eat is what you become. And it says, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, and what does it mean bad? You're just consuming all of this, you focus on all this bad stuff, you're consuming all this bad stuff, your whole body or your whole being will be full of darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Let's thank this young lady. She made a right. Let's thank God for this young lady. She made a right decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. And so uh, let's go. Let's look at it again. Let's go to uh, John 1 and 1. And when we look at it, a lot of times we forget what part our focus puts on us. And, and as I said, I don't think I said in this service, I said in another service. Okay, now. As a whole, we were founded as one nation under God, okay? Now, so a lot of things that was commonly going on in the rest of the world, we were kind of sheltered from it. So, you know, we got a lot of fluff in us. But a lot of this stuff is just kind of common in other places. When we had September the 11th, um, what happened was, uh, you know, because you have to remember, we put um, God out of our schools a couple of decades ago. And we didn't want him to have anything to do with our schools. And the reason why the enemy was uh, t targeting the schools, because now you're targeting the future generation. So that was the first target. And then now just the explosion of, of murdering our babies and, and any public forum, they don't want you to use the name Jesus. And so what happens is we're trying to push him out of every public forum. And so we're just trying to pull, push him out of everything. And so being the gentleman that he is, he's stepping back. And so September 11 is just living like the rest of the world lives. Other places get bombed. Other places have things like this. I remember one of the years uh, when Dr. Burst, he would take a team from 92, uh, 1992 to 2001, I believe, take a, a team to Africa at the end of July, August every year. One of the years they were trying to help somebody out, and I think they went to the, either the American Embassy or, or something like that, and they had went there and they left and whatever. After they left, the place got bombed. See, other countries, they kind of used to bombing. They're used to uh, the biggest thing that we're accustomed to is let's say a big storm comes and there might be a couple of zip codes without electricity. The rest, I mean, I've been in Haiti several times where what they will have is, it's just the government does it, where you only have electricity for about two hours, like maybe uh, 2 to 3.30 in the morning, I mean 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning. And the rest of the time you have no electricity because they're what? I guess they're conserving it. I don't know what they're doing. And so we, we're just full of a lot of fluff. And now we're beginning to experience certain things because we've pushed God out of everything. But this is how the rest of the world lives. And so we had September the 11th, and, you know, the planes hit those, uh, two planes hit those two twin towers. What happens, this is what they're talking about, the singleness of the eye, and what your eye is full of, your whole body gets full of. What happens is people who watch that over and over and over, they just stayed on CNN, and they were watching the, those planes go through those towers over and over and over. They were uh, finding about how they were trying to dig people out. People were talking about the actual incident over and over. They were watching hours of that for days, and the darkness that began to fill their heart was fear. So that was September the 11th. I think around September the 25th, we had already planned, uh, uh, Dr. Burris, myself, and some of our directors and our leaders here to go to a, a, a leadership conference at another church in Ohio. And so it worked out for our benefit, but because as a nation, people had got so filled with that darkness and that fear filled them, that was supposed to be a sold out flight. And it was hardly nobody on there but us. There's only a couple of people, other than staff, it was only a couple of other people other than the people who came with our group. And it worked out wonderful for us. We could stretch our legs, we could have our own role. And see, the reality is, you know, it's more dangerous, you know, more likely you have a crash in a car than you ever will in a plane. But when you focus on anything, that darkness begins to enter your heart. And whether it produces fear, whether it produces hatred, whether it produces lust, that darkness is going to produce something. So for the believer, we're called to focus on the light. Let's go to John, the Gospel of John, the first chapter. John 1 and 1. John 1 and 1, here it says, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see in uh, 1 John 5 and 7, I think we touched on it a little bit off the outline on Wednesday, the Bible says these three agree in heaven, the Father, the Word, 
and the Spirit, and these three are one. So we have one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Word, which is Jesus Christ, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so when you're walking in the light of God, people won't understand the change in you. The people won't understand why you make the decisions that you do. People won't understand why you make the stands that you do. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness. It was actually a cousin of, uh, uh, a physical cousin of Jesus born six months before him. Uh, to bear witness of the, of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, which is Jesus. That was the true light, which gives light to every man who comes into the world. And so Jesus is the light of the world. Once we get born again, you remember that old song, I, uh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine? And so our responsibility is to keep filling ourselves up with the word, keep filling ourselves up with his light. So just like that lamp, lamp does what? Lamp uh, emit, uh, brings forth that light. It shines that light out. But if we allow ourselves to be so filled with hatred, division, unforgiveness, racism, animosity, lust, perversion, rebellion, pride, we're, we're, not, we're not producing any light because it's too much darkness that we've consumed, okay? Second thing we're looking at, having a single eye, whatever we focus or look at will bring thoughts. And the thoughts produce feelings. And the feelings trigger our actions. People say, well, I don't know why I did that. Let's, 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 let's backtrack. It was something you was looking at that produced some thoughts, even if those thoughts were stuff that happened 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago. And then those thoughts produce feelings, and those feelings produce action. Let's, let's, let's put a little color on. Let's put a little um, flesh on those bones, okay? Let's say that you're married, okay? And so your husband leaves for work. You, you give each other a peck on the cheek, and you both take off and go to work, okay? So when you're at work, you start thinking about something he did two weeks ago. And you're meditating on that. You get home before he gets home, and you usually start dinner, do a few things. And so then when he gets home, uh, and so you've been thinking about what he did two weeks ago. Then from what you're thinking about, then those, those feelings of anger begin to come because you're thinking about what he did two weeks ago that he never made right. And so now you have those feelings, you have those thoughts, those thoughts feeds those feelings, and so it triggers a behavior. You get home first, you're not cooking that man any dinner. You're not doing nothing for him. He didn't repent, he didn't say he was sorry. I'm not doing nothing for him. He comes home thinking, we back to the script we left off on this morning. He comes in, he doesn't see you. Hey baby, where are you? Where are you? And then he finds you in your room with your feet up on the chair watching TV. He said, do you have a good day today? You look at him. Is everything all right with you? And then you just explode with what he did two weeks ago, and he's trying to figure out what happened. Did I get the right address? And so it's in any area of life. We have to understand what we look at. And, you know, you're going to see some of everything, but it means to look, to focus on, it's going to produce thoughts. And then those thoughts do what? They feed feelings. And then those feelings do what? They trigger behavior. So when we look at that, let's go to, um, okay, I didn't finish all two. Whatever we focus on or look at will bring uh, thoughts, and the thoughts produce feelings that can trigger our actions. Therefore, we must make a covenant with our eyes, having a single eye focusing on the light, not darkness. Let's go to Job 31 and 1. And so we have to make the decision. God, there's just certain things I am not going to look at. Because you have to realize the things that you look at, the things that you watch, thoughts, feeds, feelings. You know, even in the area of entertainment. There may be something that you might, you might watch, a movie or, or whatever. And so that movie may have been okay for once, but to go rent it and, and watch it 10 or 15 times, 
That could be too, I don't know what the movie is, but it has the potential to be feeding yourself and get too much darkness on the inside of you. Okay? And so you have to decide. It says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Now, and this is the new King James. In the old King James, it says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I think upon a maid? And see, the things that we look at, the things that we focus on, if we're focused on something, what happens? Now we have certain thoughts because of what we're focusing on. And it could just be something that happened last week, last month, last year, and you're just sitting there and you all spaced out. And, and you know, you can, somebody can ask you, a close friend, relative, or whatever can ask you. I give you, they can see you just really focused on something. There may not be a physical person or thing in front of you. It's just almost like a blank stare. And they can tell you focusing on something. They say, well, hey, I give you a penny for your thoughts. You're thinking, I wouldn't give you a billion dollars for what I'm thinking right now. Whether it's in the area of lust and perversion or whether it was in the area of murder. Don't want anybody to know what you're thinking about because you know you shouldn't be thinking what you're thinking. And so it's up to us to make a covenant. We're the ones that are responsible for doing what? Making a covenant. What we're going to allow ourselves to look at. You have to understand, uh, our eye gates, what we see, our ear gates are really the entrance, how things enter on the inside of our soul. And as we continue to meditate on it, that's when that stuff drops down into our spirit and it becomes a part of us. And so if we're filled with darkness, the only thing that can shine through us is what? Darkness and not light. Let's go to Proverbs 4 and 18. See a little bit closer. Proverbs 4 and 18. Proverbs 4 and 18. And here it simply says, it says, But the path of the just is like a shining light, and the light... Uh, and that shines ever brighter until the perfect day. And so if we're keeping our focus on God and we're keeping our focus on his word and his ways, what happens, the path that we're walking should be getting brighter and brighter. It should be light. It shouldn't be filled with darkness. And then it goes on and it says, the way of the wicked is like darkness and they do not know what makes them stumble. I can tell you what makes them stumble. What they're focusing on. They focus it on a lot of darkness. And the more you focus on that darkness, then you start having all these thoughts about that darkness. And then the, those thoughts produce some feelings about that darkness. And it triggers what? Actions that cause you to stumble. Verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. And so what do we do? Now God's word has to be weighty in our lives. Years ago, there was an old commercial. When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. I worked for him when I was in Atlanta for a short period of time before I moved back to St. Louis. Now, and so what happens is they were saying uh, the, their, their financial advice was what? Weighty. Is God's word weighty in your life? Does, does, does it mean something? Is, is this a foundation you're building your life upon God's word? And so it says what? Give attention to my words and incline your ear to my saying. And so what happened? When God is speaking, you pay attention. You listen. When you're reading the word of God, you want to focus on this because this is life, okay? Verse 21, do not let them depart from your eyes. I remember years ago, I don't see them in this service, but I don't have my contacts on my glasses so I can see you and not see you. So I just want to say something, kind of throw it in there. Anybody, don't think I'm overlooking you. I'm, I'm nearsighted. I can see anything close, but kind of far back. So if it looks like I didn't, and this, this is good too, I need to bring this out too. When I'm ministering, anybody that's been here a while, you know what I'll do. Within the course of the service, I'll look at every section. So it may seem as if my eyes are connecting with you, but I'm going to be looking at every section. There are a lot of people who felt like, well, you were just talking about me. I saw you look at me when you said that. <laughs> I'm looking at everybody. If you can understand this, I'm looking at everybody, yet nobody. And so a lot of times it's just a conviction of your heart. Okay? But anyhow, 
let me go back to this. But anyway, I remember this gentleman, this is probably like 20 years ago, and he's still living and everything like that. About 20 years ago, he was attacked with cancer, and it was uh, a member of our church, and it was all through his lipnoids. And so the doctors felt like, well, you know, he really wasn't going to be able to survive this. And so what happens is, I don't remember what the reason being, but I know uh, Dr. Burris and myself got in his truck during that period of time. We got in his truck, and on his dashboard, he had all of these index cards, all of these index cards. And on the index cards, they had all healing scriptures on them. Because regardless of what the report of the doctor was, he was keeping a single focus or a single eye on what the report of the Lord was. Okay? Now, and so as a whole, you make the decision. I remember when, uh, when, when people come up here for prayer, uh, they're supposed to get a card. And it tells you what you should do before prayer, what you should do after prayer. But you have to agree with the prayer. and You have to agree with what the word says about you being healed by the stripes of Jesus. You have to mix your faith with it. Now, when uh, Pastor Kemp was here, he told people after they got prayer, he said that for 10 days, he, he wanted them to get 30 healing scriptures. And then for 10 days, read them three times a day. Now, what happens, there may be some who continued and some didn't. But we have to question ourselves. Okay, if we would have went to the doctor for a particular sickness, disease, infirmity, and he would have told us, we want you to do this medical treatment at home, or we want you to take this medication three times a day for 10 days, you would do it. Now, you have to understand the reason why you would do it because you have confidence in that physician's prescription. When you don't meditate upon the Word of God, healing scriptures, amen, when you are a body's attack with sickness and disease, it is because you do not have confidence in God's Word to heal. Verse 21. Uh, again, do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to what? All their flesh. God's word is. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. And so we have to be diligent about what we watch, what we listen to, what we focus on. For out of it springs the issues of life. It's just like a water course. How whatever we focus on is going to really determine the course that our life takes. And then it says... Verse 24, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. The Bible says in 1 Peter, the third chapter, I believe it is, if you want to see good days and live a long life, let your tongue refrain from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. What you speak out of your mouth has a big uh, impact on your future and on your fruitfulness. The Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And they that love it are going to eat what? The fruit of it. Don't think the words that you speak is not going to affect you. You can come up for every healing line, whether I'm praying, Pastor Kemp, or whoever else come in this church, or any of the other people that come up here to pray with you. And you can pray for, I mean, we can pray one thing, we can declare one thing, we can lose the healing anointing in your body. But then if you go home and you eat dinner, you say, well, you know, they say there's no cure for this. And talk about my infirmity, whatever it may be. See, your words have a part to play in your, it has a big part to play in your destiny. A big part. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established. Do not turn from the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. So what is he saying? Have a single eye and don't allow darkness in. Let's look at our final point on this. Three, we must repent and make efforts to stop looking. And you know, repentance is simply a change of mind, change of direction. We must repent and make efforts to stop looking or focusing. And what's, what's the word the Bible used? Have a single eye. Stop looking or focusing on things that causes darkness to flow through us and not light. See, when we're consumed with different things that cause us to be bitter, to cause us to have unforgiveness, to cause us to have a hatred and strife and division, well, out of the bunch of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what's going to emanate out of us. We're supposed to be lamps. Light is supposed to emanate out of us. But if we're, we're focused on darkness, darkness is going to emanate out of us. And so 
Uh, three, again, we must repent and make efforts to stop looking or focusing, having that single eye like we're supposed to, on things that cause darkness to flow through us and not light. So we're going to have a single eye, only going to focus on the things that's going to produce light. Let's go to Matthew 5 and 27. Matthew 5 and 27. Matthew 5 and 27, and here it simply says, Ye have heard that it was said to those of old, Ye shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Whosoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so what do we say? When you're looking, you're focusing, you're longing after, you're looking or whatever, it, it brings what? Thoughts. Thoughts do what? Produces feelings. And then what do you do? Uh, it becomes a trigger to your actions, Okay. And if, you, if your right hand, if your right eye causes you to see it, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than that your whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to see it, cut it off and cast it, for, cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Now, you have to understand, God has never been for self uh, 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 mutilation, okay? So he didn't want us pl plucking out our eyes. He didn't want us cutting off our arms. But he's using us to say, you need to do what you need to do. Right. It's nothing that's too much to do. Now, of course, he's not into self-mutilation. But other than that, it's, it's, it's nothing that's too much of extreme. How many people here saw the movie uh, Fireproof? Raise your hand. Okay, more, a little bit more than half. And so, we, well, quite a bit more than half. But anyway, so with that movie, what happened when this man uh, got on this pursuit, he was trying to restore his marriage, but then in the, in the path, he, he really began to enter into a relationship with God. And what he had, his struggle had been pornography, okay? And so what happened was, that was the third person in his marriage. You have to understand, any marriage between two believers, and initially he wasn't a believer though, but any uh, marriage between two believers, really, it might take some work, but it can work. As long as there's not a third party involved. That third party can be a physical human being, or it can be a, a media being. It can be pornography. But when they won't let go of the third party, you can't fix it. Can't fix it till that third party gets out the mix. And so what happens is, he, uh, so now he's, he's trying to follow Christ, he's trying to get his marriage restored, and he's just online, and he's trying not to do the um, uh, pornography anymore, and he's just online looking at boats because he likes boats. And then this pop-up comes, and it's trying to get him to click on to go to a pornography site. And so he sits there, and you know, you've got to get to a point, instead of keep trying to resist temptation, why not just get rid of it? You say you want to, you want to, <clears throat> Stop doing X, Y, and Z. Why are you keeping it so handy? Why are you keeping it so close? Why are you making provisions for your flesh? And so what he did, he picked up the computer, he took it outside, he got a bat, and he smashed it. To some people, they say, oh, that's just too much. That's not too much. That's what the scriptures say do. Where is your evidence you want to be free? Where is your evidence you want to be delivered? Where is your evidence that you want to be made whole? And so in this particular passage, he's talking about looking at a woman. So it's not a physical, he's looking at this woman, lusting at this woman. And so something he's doing with his eyes and something that he's doing with his hands. What is he doing? He's masturbating. Now, some people have a problem. She said masturbating in church. Yeah. Anything the Bible talks about, I'm going to talk about. Second thing you need to understand, anytime you hear these people say, well, I'm just silent on what the Bible is silent on, you know one of two things. Either that's a cop out because they don't want to speak on hard issues. Or secondly, they don't study and they don't know the word. They don't know what's in there. But because God has his word as our manual for life, everything to do with life or anything people might deal with in life, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, it's going to be in here. Because he, this is our manual for life, and he wants us to live a life that's pleasing and upright for him, and so before him, so he touches on everything. 
And so if they talk about I'm silent on what the Bible is silent about, as I said, either they don't want to say hard things. You might say, well, why would they want to say hard things? You remember, I think it's around John the sixth chapter when there was a multitude of people following Jesus. And then he said, eat my, he, eat my uh, body and, and drink my blood. And, and then uh, he, uh, they said, that's a hard saying. And the Bible said many stopped following him. And there were thousands of there of his disciples. And many stopped following him. And so then it was just his, pretty much his, his regular crew, his initial crew or whatever. And he said, are you going to leave me too? And then Peter said, well, where can we go? Who else has the bread of eternal life? And so a lot of times because they fear offending people instead of pleasing God, they won't say hard saying and they know what's in there. And then the second thing, some people just don't really study the word. They don't know what's in there. Okay. But anyway. And so with that, people say, well, what's a person to do? I remember Dr. Dufresne, after he had got divorced, his wife, when he had got married years and years and years ago, he and his wife were not saved, okay? And so then he got saved. Later on, his wife got saved. And so she got saved, but she didn't really dump all the way in. When he got saved, he just jumped all the way in. So she never was quite, like, sold out, but she was saved. And so what happened was, over the years, as the ministry grew, he always talks about how the anointing breaks the yoke. And so even though they were united, united in that bond of marriage, as he began to uh, continue to increase in anointing, that bond broke. And she began to have an affair with his pilot. He didn't know it. And so then what happened is she comes to him one day, say, I don't love you, I never loved you, and I want a divorce. And then he finds out she had been having an affair with his pilot for quite a while. And so from that point, from the time she divorced him up until he married uh, uh, Pastor Nancy, who was just Nancy, an ex, uh, one of the ex um, a beauty queens or whatever, beauty pageant winners. What he said, uh, he just took a lot of cold showers. For people who say, if you can't masturbate, what you going to do? Take a couple of cold showers. All right. And so then when we go on, let's go to 1 John 3 and 15. 1 John 3 and 15. And here it states, it says, Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. You mean just because I hate so-and-so, I'm a murderer? Well, the truth of the matter is you'd like to see the murder. You just wouldn't do it. That's what hatred produces. That's why I say if you look upon a woman to lust after in your own heart, you've already committed adultery because it's already in your heart to do it. You just didn't physically do it. But then the reason why we know he's also dealing with masturbation because he's talking about not only plucking out an eye, but he's also talking about what? Cutting off an arm or a hand, okay? And so what happens is, just like you may have not physically had sexual intercourse with that person, but he calls it adultery, what happens is you may not have physically murdered the person, but the root of hate is always murder. When you hate somebody, the fruit that is, comes from that is murder. And so what happens is, First, you focus on something. And sometimes we hate people who have not directly done anything to us. It could have been somebody that has hurt, harmed, or wronged a friend or a loved one. And we hate them because of that. Or it can be that we judge, judge somebody's actions. And we do, uh, we say, well, this righteous judgment is still judgment, judgment that produces hatred. And that's not righteous. And so out of our judging someone's behavior or judging someone's words, what we have are just judging them. Sometimes we just judge people by where they came from. But from our judgment of them, we now hate them. And so what happens is we think about that and those, those, those focusing on that, it produces thoughts about them, which produces feelings of what? Hatred, which triggers what? Actions. And so whether it actually goes to murder, it's going to trigger all other actions to try to hurt or harm, whether it's through your words or whether it's other means to try to harm the person. Hatred produces murder, okay? And so what happens is we feel like it's all right to hate somebody. It's not all right to hate somebody. And God judges hatred as murder, just like he judges lust and masturbation as adultery. Let's go on. Let's go to first, uh, stay still at first John. Let's go to chapter one, verse five, our last scripture. First John one, verse five. And here it says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you 
And see, what happens is the message that we're supposed to be communicating, anybody from a pulpit, the message we all are supposed to be communicating is what we have heard from him, which is God. And we do what? We declare that to you. That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. You know, fear is darkness. Hatred and racism is darkness. Lust and perversion, darkness. Any kind of sin is what? Darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him, which is God, and walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. And so we'll be filled with our hatred, we'll be filled with our division, we'll be filled with our strife, we'll be filled with unforgiveness, we'll be filled with perversion and lust and adultery and all of these type of things. Fear, worry, anxiety, we're filled with all these type of things and we're saying that we have fellowship with God? Doesn't mean that you're not still born again. Doesn't mean that you're not still his child, but you didn't cut the lines of communications through all the darkness that you're walking in. God is calling us to do what? Repent. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his sons, does what? It cleanses us from all sin. Eight, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. What some people do, <clears throat> it's always good to repent. What some people do, but you have to understand what repentance is. Repentance simply means to change your mind and change direction. I was going one way, and I was doing something, and now I'm going to turn, and I'm going to stop going that way, and I'm going to stop doing that thing. That's all repentance is. Repentance is good. When we're turning from the uh, things that we should not be doing to turn from that, that's good. But with God, he not only wants us to repent, but he wants us to confess our sins. Now, when we say confess, we have to understand. Confess literally means to say the same thing. I cannot call myself confessing my sins to God when I tell God, well, God, you know I made a mistake. Well, what if it really was a mistake, but it's a sin? The Bible calls it a presumptuous sin, but it's still a sin. A mistake is, well, you know, I was going one place and I was supposed to make a left turn, I made a right. That's a mistake. I was baking something, I was supposed to put in one cup of flour, I put in two cups of flour, that's a mistake. A sin is anything that the written word of God or the spoken word of God tells you not to do and you do it anyway, that's a sin of commission. A sin of omission is anything that the written word or the spirit of the Lord tells you to do and you omit to do that thing, you won't do it. A big thing for most people is forgiveness. I mean, they'll do anything. They'll give you the shirt off their back, they'll do whatever. Just don't make me forgive. Just don't make me forgive. Because, you know, you don't know what they did to me. That's still a sin of omission. It doesn't matter what they did. And so what happens is when we actually confess that thing, we tell God, he called it a sin, we call it a sin. Well, what if it was just a mistake? If it's a mistake, but it falls in the category of something that God told you to do or don't do, and you did what he told you not to do or you didn't do what he told you uh, to do, and it was a mistake, it's still what? A presumptuous sin. We confess our sins. God, I sinned against you. It's presumptuous, but it was still sin. Or, God, I sinned against you. I didn't do what I knew I was supposed to do. God, I sinned against you. I committed a sin of omission. God, I didn't do what I knew I was supposed to do, or I did do something I knew I really wasn't supposed to do. So I confess that sin to you. And the Bible says that, that God, when he forgives us, he separates our sins as far as the east is from the rest, west, <clears throat> and he remembers them no more. And what happens when we come to God for forgiveness, the Bible the scripture we just read, when we confess our sins unto him, he is faithful. I don't care what you did. And a lot of people, the biggest problem they have is forgiving themselves. God immediately forgives you no matter what you do if you're willing to simply confess your sins and repent. And so what happens when we confess our sins unto him, he is faithful and he's just to not only forgive us of all of our sins, it doesn't matter what it is, but then he does what? And he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. 
this is written to born again believers. And so once we got born again, we have the light of Christ on the inside of us. But a lot of times we've been consuming a lot of darkness. And it becomes unrighteousness on the inside of us. And when we confess that to God, not only does he forgive us, but then he comes in and he does what? He washes and cleanses us from all that darkness and all that unrighteousness. When you repent and don't confess, you're just trying to walk this thing out on your own. But when you repent and confess, you're able to walk it out with his help because he's come in to cleanse you from all that unrighteousness. Let's stand to our feet, please. Let's stand to our feet, please. And we're just going to lift our hands up before the Lord. We were praying for our nation at the beginning of the service, and now we're going to pray for ourselves now. Let's lift our hands up and repeat after me. Say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your power. Your word tells me if I cover my sins, I won't prosper. But if I confess them, and forsake them, I'll find mercy. Father God, your word tells me that if I confess my sins unto you, you are faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I repent of unforgiveness. Every person that I've been holding offense or unforgiveness in my heart towards, whether it was an individual, individuals, or a group. I repent of that now, and I release them, Lord. I release them of the offense. I release them of the unforgiveness that I've held in my heart against them. And I release myself of that offense and unforgiveness. And in the name of Jesus, I bless every person or every group of persons that I've been holding unforgiveness or offense against. I bless them now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every sin of omission or commission that I've committed, I confess, and I forsake those sins now. I cover everybody in here with the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. There's healing in the blood. There's deliverance in the blood. There's divine protection in the blood. In the name of Jesus Christ, I decree the blood of Jesus over everybody in here. In the name of Jesus, I command every spirit of anger, rage, malice, bitterness, and hatred. I command you to loose me. I command you to go from me now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, every spirit of prejudice, Racism, division, strife, contention, and murder. I break your powers. I bind your works. I command you to loose me. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of fear, worry, anxiety, and confusion, and stress, and trauma. I break your powers. I bind your works. I command you to loose me. And I command you to go. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of lust. Perversion. Homosexuality. Oral sex. Fornication. Adultery. Pornography. I break your powers. Every pedophile spirit, I break your powers. I bind your works. I command you to loose me. I command you to go in Jesus' name. I break every sexual tie that I have with any person that I'm not presently married to. 
I break those ties now. In the name, the blood, the authority of Jesus Christ. I break every soul tie that will pull me outside of the will of God. Every ungodly soul tie with every person or every place. I break it now. In the name, the blood, the authority of Jesus Christ. Every spirit of insecurity, inferiority, self-hate, and suicide, and self-mutilation, I break your powers, I bind your works, I command you to go. Spirits of depression, spirits of oppression, spirits of mental illness, I break your powers, I bind your works, I command you to go. Every spirit of physical illness, infirmity, sickness, disease, weakness, and pain, I break your powers, I bind your works, I command you to loose my body, I command you to go, 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 in the name, the blood, the authority of Jesus Christ, loose my body now, go, pain that's associated with stress in my neck, in my back, in my arms. I break your powers. I bind your works. I command you to go. Headaches, migraines, associated with stress. I break your powers. I bind your works. I command you to go. That spirit of stress and inflammation in my body that brings sickness and disease. I break your powers. I bind your works. I command you to loose me and go. I decree that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I decree that I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I walk in victory. I walk in freedom and I walk in love. I decree it, I say that it's so, and I thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We glorify you, we honor you, we magnify you, we exalt your name, we exalt your name, we glorify you, we honor you in your house, we honor you in your house, God. We glorify you and honor you. We glorify you and we honor you. We glorify you and 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 honor you. We magnify your holy name. We magnify your holy name. We enjoy your presence, God. We enjoy your presence. We step into your will in every area of our life. We step into your will in every area of our life. We step into your will in every area of your life. Some of you all have willfully steps outside of the will of God. So let's just do this symbolically. I want you to take a step and say, I am stepping in to the will of God I am leaving my place and my season of disobedience outside of the will of God. I have stepped into the will of God and I am be planted in your will and I'm going to flourish even in my old age. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory, glory, glory. Glory to God, 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 glory to God. God says many are the situations and the circumstances that are here, 
but I'm aware of every situation. I'm aware of every circumstance. And on this day, as you have stepped into my will, you're going to see an unfolding and an unfolding and an unfolding and an unfolding of my blessings, an unfolding and an unfolding and an unfolding of favor, an unfolding and an unfolding and an unfolding of my purpose because you have made the deception, you have made the decision to step inside of my will. For some of that, that means relationships that you were not supposed to be in. Extramarital affairs, but relationships that you were not supposed to be into. And you remind yourself, when you stepped forward, you stepped into the will of God, and out of those things, those decisions that you had made outside of the will of God. God can do it. He 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 can do it. Some of you all feel it's almost like blackmail. If I step out, will they tell? Understand this. I decided a long time ago, the best way to beat it, tell on yourself. But sometimes people are staying in places and situations they shouldn't because they're fear of, of what we call black field. Not that anybody's going to try to do any money, but it, it, it's in different situations. But you, 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 did, you didn't want to come out even though you knew you were supposed to come out in certain situations because you thought the people that you was involved in that seeing wit was going to tell. Forget about them telling. You walk in freedom. Let's take our seats, please. Let's take our seats.